Good evening, everyone. My name is Kyle Jensen, and I'm the Director of Writing Programs at Arizona State University. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first Tomorrow Talk series event for 2023-2024. The Tomorrow Talk series places the thought leaders of today in conversation with the change makers of tomorrow, our students. Each distinguished speaker will explain how they use writing to address our most pressing challenges. This evening, we welcome Maya Rose Craig, author of Bird Girl, Looking to the Skies in Search of a Better Future. Maya Rose Craig, also known as Bird Girl, is a 21-year-old British Bangladeshi ornithologist, environmentalist, and diversity activist. At age 11, she started the popular blog Bird Girl, and at age 17, she became the youngest person to see half of the birds in the world. Craig campaigns for equal access to nature and to end the climate and biodiversity loss crises, issues which she believes are intrinsically linked, while promoting global climate justice. She also fights for the rights of Indigenous peoples and is an ambassador for the Survivor Survival International. Today, Craig will be talking with my colleague, Natalie lazinski Beach, an assistant professor in the School of International Letters and Cultures at ASU a senior scholar in the Julie Ann Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory and an affiliate faculty member in Jewish studies. Lazinski Veach's work asks how art and philosophy can help us live more ethical lives, not only in relation to other humans, but also with regard to other animals and the environment. Among other things, she teaches classes on post-humanism, animal studies, gender, disability, and ecological thought. Please join me in welcoming Maya Rose Craig and Natalie Lazinski Veach. Hi, Maya. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, thank you also to the organizers for giving us the opportunity to have a conversation about your book and your work. And um, yeah, let's let's jump right in, shall we? Um, so my first question is kind of a devil's advocate question. Mm. And that is because, you know, obviously I teach courses in which we read literature. I really believe in literature as a means to get us to think and to reconsider our perspective on the world. But my question for you is, you are incredibly media savvy, right? You started your blog when you were just 11. I, I looked through your Instagram. There, there are so many things out there, so many ways of communicating with the world out there today that seem so much more ever present than, mm -hmm. than a book, right? Especially a physical book. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, why did you choose to write a book? of all things. What what can a book do that maybe other forms of communication cannot do? Yeah, I think that's a totally valid question, considering that, for example, some of the content that I've posted online has had like hundreds of thousands at least views sometimes if it gets spread around. And obviously, I, I think for me, a book feels like it does something very different from other forms of media and communication. Um, one being that it's much slower. I think the the pace at which we consume content online is so rapid that um, even if you do sort of scroll past a post talking about different issues, um, it's not going to sink in in the same way. I think you see that a lot and people kind of talk about like Instagram activism, like reposting stuff on your stories that probably is saying the right things, but it's not sinking in in the same way. And for me, actually being able to write the book, I was able to kind of sink my teeth into a lot of issues that have a lot more depth and complexity than maybe you can explain online um, but I think also because I've always wanted to write a book I've loved writing since I was a kid and I wanted to write a book about birds I knew that in particular and kind of every it was only when I started kind of writing out the story about birds that I realized also it was a story around kind of health and mental illness and climate change and all of these other issues as well. Yeah, uh, I I love that you put a stress on attention and uh, the the kind of having to having to sit with something, right? Mm -hmm. Also, also as a reader, when you when you take on a book, it's something that you have to open up towards to a certain extent. You have to be kind of willing to go along with with the narrative voice, uh, whether that's an autobiography, a memoir, as in your case, or whether it's fiction. One, one of the things that really struck me about your book actually has to do with attention. 
And um, those were your descriptions, mm. right? So the, the book is, of course, divided up bird by bird. Um, and there are actual drawings of birds, which is, is just striking to, to find in a book these days, right? Um, and then those, those little almost um, biographical snippets about these birds that introduce us to them and to the, the context in which they find themselves today, especially in relation to, to climate change and habitat loss and uh, all of these urgent questions. And at, at one point in the book, when, when you're in the Arctic and you... Um, talk about the writing that has been done about this place, right? You, you, in the book, you say that your own words cannot come close to describing that everything that, that you're taking in. But for me, I've never been to the Arctic. I've never been to many of the places that you write about. And for me, you actually did take me there, right? I, I kind of had the sense that through these incredibly vivid and almost tangible descriptions, of, of bird encounters, it's almost like we as readers are there with you, right? And you not only guide our, um, you, you not only entertain us, even though it is entertaining, but you also guide our attention in a way that if, you know, we might not know where to look without your guidance, right? So what, what I really loved were sometimes there, there were creatures, birds, that I would not think of as special. And yet you get so super excited about them, right? And then you start describing them and you use um, techniques, like you use a lot of humor, you use kind of anthropomorphic narratives. Um, and I was wondering, how did you go about writing these passages, these bird descriptions? Like uh, what was your process, your thinking? Because clearly it succeeded. So how did you get there? Thank you. Um, I, I think, weirdly, in a lot of cases, writing about the birds was some of the easiest parts for me, partially because I genuinely remember them all so vividly compared to kind of thinking back to actual past events. It probably gets quite murky and you've sort of dredged through to figure out what really happened. But the birds I always could, could picture in my mind. Um, and to be honest, just writing about them anyway, like obviously I, I love birds and nature and so just being able to write like beautiful purple prose about nature was just a real joy for me. Um, and I think the main thing I was trying to do is sort of convey how I was perceiving these birds, kind of the places that my eyes were drawn to in terms of plumage, but also as you said, I kind of did humanize them and give them personalities. And it's because when you see kind of am animals around you, I think it's very human to give them human characteristics. Um, and that's kind of part of how you view nature in the world. And so it's like, absolutely, I don't think I could like write a description of going to the jungle or going to the Arctic better than like, you know, the explorers of old, but something about... Um, writing about the birds themselves felt very special to me. I think also it's probably because how I experienced a lot of these places was through the nature and through the birds. And so maybe like, I probably couldn't give a description of the country as a whole, but when it comes to the birds, I can do that because like we, we mentioned earlier kind of about slowing down and pausing. And for me, well, something that's obvious in the book is for me, like I use birds as that anchor to sort of make myself slow down which I think is probably partially why I am able to like I, I have a terrible memory actually I think literally all the space is taken up by birds um but like why I am able to sort of look back and remember what all of this looked felt felt like the excitement like all of it um yeah yeah I, I mean this is also really resonant with me because uh you, you note again and again, also on your blog, um, and incredibly humbly too, right, that you've been so lucky to have mm -hmm. been able to do the kind of traveling you've been able to do at a young age, especially with your mom's illness and the challenges that your family faced because of that, right? And you're very aware that not everybody has these opportunities, 
right? And so it almost felt to me like your book is almost a little window into being able to come along, right? Even if we can't physically come along, it's it's something that allows us to get there. And of course, we we all know that personal experiences with nature, with other animals are vital. I mean, you, you founded a whole organization, Black to Nature, uh, in order to promote and enable experiences and connections to nature for visible minority ethnic youth, right? So, so you know that this is important. Uh, what, what I'm curious about is what role do you think other, other forms of engagement can play? Like literature, of course, but also art, um, other media, maybe even, you know, David Attenborough narrating a, a wildlife documentary, right? It, what, what roles do they play in making us aware of, of the richness and the beauty all around us? And are some of these encounters more effective than others in kindling not only attention, but also a sense of care? Mm. Yeah, I mean, thank you so much. That's really kind. Like, and I think part of the reason the book feels like that is because I wrote it during COVID when I was like trapped in my house we had very very strong lockdown laws in the UK and I literally wasn't able to go outside and so kind of writing this book was actually for me as well a way of experiencing nature and traveling the world Um, and I kind of wanted it almost it was like my version of an Attenborough documentary um, and I, I genuinely think that media in general is so, to this day, kind of underappreciated in terms of, like, it sounds obvious, but in terms of the communication of ideas, and even in terms of, I do a lot of um, activism and campaigning, and I genuinely describe being an activist as being a storyteller, because a lot of what you're trying to do is figure out how to effectively package and communicate these ideas so that not only people understand them, but people understand emotionally how that's going to affect them and their lives and the things that they care about. Um, So like, for example, in terms of climate change in the UK, sort of trying to communicate that people are already experiencing the effects of it and it is making people's lives worse and it is disproportionately affecting poorer and ethnic minority communities. And, you know, all of these things that people maybe know intellectually but aren't understanding emotionally. Um, And I think... Part, that's partly why I did set up um, my charity, Back to Nature, is because, like, I the, the reason that I became kind of involved in environmental campaigning at quite a young age was because I had been lucky enough to kind of see the world as, as well as see, like, terrible examples of environmental destruction. And that was something that really motivated me. And I kind of felt like, um, I, I guess other people experiencing nature in the outdoors and being able to fall in love with it is partially how you motivate people to care about environmental issues. I think especially like, um, obviously climate change is a big issue at the moment for most people at least, um, because they kind of understand that it's a human issue. But I think other environmental issues, people maybe kind of see that as separate from their own personal lives um because the links often aren't communicated very well and so it's like you know why should we care that trees are getting chopped down over there I need to worry about my own life and money and paying my rent and you know all that kind of thing um so yeah I think every form of communication and media kind of combined is how we're going to um hopefully push for change in terms of all of these things yeah, I mean, what, what you're describing here, this, this sense of this has nothing to do with me, right? Even, I mean, there, there's such a cognitive dissonance going on, even when we're fully aware of how it's affecting us, even physically, right? Right here in Phoenix, we just went through the hottest summer, I think, on record. So we, we had over 115 degree Fahrenheit temperatures every day for a really long time and it wouldn't cool down at night right and so it was so extreme that um the the cactuses which are supposed to grow here they started dying from the heat right but and yet it's sometimes really really hard to make this connection to human caused events 
especially for, for people who are just going through their everyday lives, right? In the, in the book, you touch on the, the fact that 70% of greenhouse emissions, I think since the 1980s, are the result of 100 corporations, right? So there's this tension between the need for, of course, personal accountability, but also structural and political change on a really, really grand scale, right? And, and to balance that and to, to get people involved, I think it, that is a challenge for all of us. Um, of course, we're having this conversation in an academic setting, right? Um, this is promoted by Arizona State University and um, it's, we're a university that really cares about sustainability. It's something that is intertwined in almost everything that we do. But I, I was wondering, to what extent do you think higher education, especially, has a role to play in communicating these things that you're talking about in, in raising awareness, right? And, and how can we do that better? Yeah, big question. Um, yeah, I think um, more than ever, kind of academia and education are incredibly important, I think, because it feels like there's a movement of anti-intellectualism at the moment. Um, we had a politician in the UK recently say, like, everyone hates experts, you know, no one wants to listen to experts, um, which personally, I think is really alarming. Um, because I do think that academics have, um, obviously, you guys know this, like a critical role in terms of learning and education, and also prioritization in terms of issues. And, and so, yeah, obviously, higher education is incredibly important, but it's about kind of how to communicate that. And I do think that a lot of environmental issues maybe aren't communicated as effectively as they could be often because a lot of the time it's framed in a very kind of scientific way that means very little to everyday people um, or it's kind of big numbers that terrify people, um, neither of which are super helpful. Um, you know, kind of the world's going to end by 2040 kind of vibes. Um, so I think there's a lot of that going on. And so it's instead trying to figure out, I don't know, almost like snappy things to communicate to people where it's just like yes this and this um but I think also you you mentioned earlier kind of the systemic versus the individual and this is such a big like this is a big thing for me in that I think the way that environmental issues and climate change have been framed as an issue of individual change in behavior is like one of the biggest tricks that fossil fuel companies have managed to pull on us um, in that this wasn't the way that we thought about things for a very long time until a think tank funded by BP um, basically started spreading the idea of the carbon footprint that everyday people needed to start thinking very carefully about their everyday choices because they were the ones destroying your planet. And it was essentially a distraction from the fact that it was in fact these fossil fuel companies and so I think even though individual change is incredibly important in the long term um, especially in terms of making sure something like climate change doesn't happen in the future and continue to happen if we do somehow manage to solve climate change um, you know we are needing that big cultural shift but I think at the moment there kind of isn't enough acknowledgement that it's not really about people, you know, cycling to work every day and things like that. It's, it's about um, massive shifts and clamping down in terms of a handful of very, very wealthy corporations that wouldn't really have an impact on everyday people's lives. And I think that's kind of where the dissonance is, where at the moment, there's this idea that we all kind of have to live in mud shacks with no heat or electricity and eat plants, you know, to solve climate change. And it's not about that. Um, it's about corporate greed. Um, so I think personally, that is the big message that I think people need to understand more because it is systemic political change that's needed. Yeah, absolutely. I think 
It's also incredibly dispiriting, right, to, to think about a future in which we, we are so small that we can't change anything individually. And I, I really liked how you strike that balance in between pointing out the systemic global, not only uh, exploitation through our capitalist systems, right, but also the the kind of small choices that we we can make like ecotourism right you you're right about that and and you're not you're not wearing blinders like you know you know you're you're flying all over the world right you're aware of the impact that that has but then you think through uh, okay what but what am i contributing to in south america when when i'm there on the ground what am i i enabling with my choices, um, how am I supporting the, the agency of the local peoples, right, to provide for themselves in ways other than deforestation and, and so on, right? And I, I found that incredibly, it was it was nice to, to read about choice and agency without it being preachy, mm -hmm. I guess, right? Yeah. Um, if, if we're on this, this topic of, of change and activism. Um, so as I, I teach courses on environmental topics, right? And on animals. And often the, the thing that strikes me when I first walk into the classroom on the very first day of a semester is that at least 85% of the class is female mm. or, you know, gender non-conforming. Mm. And also when you look at uh, climate activism it's young women who are the faces of climate activism right it's it's you it's Greta Thunberg it's Luisa Neubauer in Germany um, and I, I wonder what what are your thoughts on that how why first of all and what, what is it about about these environmental issues that that makes it resonate for young women especially and um, what do young women bring to the table on that topic? Yeah, I think, um, I actually think this is one of the things that makes kind of environmental circles really interesting because they are often very female dominated. Um, and I think, I, th I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One being that actually that's always been the case, even looking back to movements in the US in the 60s, for example, um, it was both dominated by women and very often led by women as well. Um, and I, I think that's partially because caring for nature and the environment and the future is almost seen as like feminine coded, which obviously is bizarre. But there have been, um, I think there's a few quite famous studies to do with men fearing doing things for the environment because they think it will see them as feminine so instead they like toss their trash in the street and they carry on eating meat because they don't want to seem girly basically mm -hmm. um so I think there is an element of that going on um but I think also I do think it's deeper than that in that um I feel like there's something in there to do with earth and nature also being female um or often perceived as feminine in some shape or form and essentially it is capitalism and consumerism kind of plundering it and I think that there is something I don't know because I don't, I don't want to fall into kind of the very easy metaphors but it does feel like there's something in that that a lot of women can see that there is something to stop there um or maybe it is just that a lot of women fall into the roles of caretaker and that kind of extrapolates out into also caring for the planet. I, I don't know. Um, but I think on the flip side of things, something that I do see a lot is that it is female dominated, but quite often it will be a pyramid of women with a man that has kind of crawled over all of them to get to the top as well. Because very often when you look kind of in CEO and leader positions, it is still men. So I think there's a lot of weird, interesting stuff with a lot of kind of cultural ripples to do with the environmental movement. Because I think even though this kind of all sounds quite like 
art student I guess like I think it has a lot of genuine cultural repercussions in why people don't seem to care about environmental issues and why you know we're always talking about like oh we should be talking about the economy instead and things like that I, I genuinely think it is linked to all of that yeah I mean the, the, the old trope of mother nature right I mean there's this academic movement called ecofeminism that uh, builds on the the this alliance that you're talking about, like re repression of women, repression of people of color, and repression and exploitation of uh, natural environments, often go hand in hand. These are interlocking oppressions, right? And so finding alliances there and being able to support each other maybe is also more, more of an urgent call in, in that context. Um, can I ask you a very kind of academic, philosophical, weird question? Um, so, I mean, it's it's like a two part question. So, when I started reading your book, right, I knew nothing about birding at all. So that's the background. But the one thing that struck me, kind of, in initially, um, is that birding offers us an incredibly different and unusual framework for encountering other animals that than we usually get right so what i mean by that is the human experience is not at the center we're not the protagonists in the story there's this really um very funny brief passage uh, that you write when you're describing your little big year and you write, birds don't give a hoot about our big ears and are often less than helpful. They fly off, hide when you're looking for them, and pop up in distant locations at inconvenient times, right? And that really, it it's so neatly summarizes that when it comes to birding, humans do not run the show. It's a completely different framework. It requires attention, as, as we touched on, it requires patience. And it really seems to me to foster a particular kind of humility. So it's very different, for, for example, from going to the zoo, right? You go to the zoo, the animal is already there, it's, it's caged, you, you pay, you get in, you get to look, you get to be entertained, you get to go home. And all the while, your idea of, of your human self as the protagonist in the story of the world hasn't really been shaken. And birding does something in incredibly powerful in that way. So in, in academic terms, I would say that it promotes a shift from anthropocentric, so human-focused perspectives to an ecocentric worldview. All of a sudden, we're no, no longer at the center, but that's okay because there's this realization that we're part of this greater web of life, right? And there, there seems to be a way in which birding fosters eco-consciousness in a very, very unique way. And I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit more and perhaps also touch on how else we can nurture this kind of attention, this kind of patience, this kind of decentering if we don't have the, the ability to go birding, especially in our immediate environments, right? Because often when, when we're in an exotic place, we're on vacation, it's very easy to be struck by the beauty all around us. But when we're in an urban place, you don't really notice that uh, the grackles that you see everywhere are actually stunning, right? Yeah. So. No, absolutely. And I love how you phrased that as well, because I think you've put into words something that I've always felt, but maybe never articulated. Because um, I talk a lot, both in the book and in life, I guess, um, about how I feel like bird watching is fan or just being out in nature is fantastic kind of for mental health and mental well-being and obviously a big thread throughout the book is how we kind of used bird watching as a tool to deal with my mum's bipolar disorder and the ways that we were also struggling because of that. Um, and I, I talk about how I've always been terrible at mindfulness and meditation, but bird watching is my version of mindfulness. And I think that's because there's something um, incredibly grounding about it. And it, it it's, 
you know, the implication of being out in nature and surrounded by nature. But I think it's more than that because you can't um, be listening to music because you need to hear what's around you. You can't be too distracted or on your phone because you're looking around you. And so it's something about having to be absolutely present and grounded in the mu moment that I think is kind of fantastic for people. Um, but also I think fosters a different relationship with nature and the outdoors than you would with other kind of outdoorsy hobbies like yeah. I don't know why kayaking is the only one I can think of right now but like all of all of that kind of thing um and, but not to big up bird watching because obviously there are various other examples of things like that um I don't know various other kind of nature categorizing things but also um you know even just different mindsets that you can have while going on walks outdoors and things like that um but I think kind of the slow quiet appreciation for what nature does for us and what we do for it I think is incredibly important um like even for context in the UK um the last 10 years or so our healthcare system has been doing green prescribing which is literally telling people to go outside um and um not touch grass to um like you know spend spend some time in a green space um and like a lot of the work I do is kind of figuring out how people can form that connection to nature without having to go into the countryside or into big national parks um because there's a lot of issues in the UK to do with um class and race barriers versus kind of access to green spaces and um that's one of the reasons that I think birds in particular are fantastic because they are a piece of nature that is present no matter how urban or rural the environment that you live in is um and like you said even slowing down and observing the nature you have on your doorstep is really good for you even if it is just like a pigeon um you know like there is something beautiful about all of it and if you kind of take a moment to look past what you think of it and just enjoy whether that is yeah a tree a bird an insect I don't know um like there is something very special about that and I think just in general we talk about people and nature like we're very separate entities um and we're not and I think part of the reason that people struggle so much is because we have separated ourselves from nature but and this is the same kind of why I have issues with kind of eco-fascism and kind of humans were a plague on the planet because that's not how it works we are part of the planet we are part of nature but we have distanced ourselves and we need to refine that both for our sake and for the sake of the planet um I don't know if that answered that question but yeah yeah you did you did and you actually kind of led directly into my my next question um, which which has to do with you know these these really fascinating and terrifying times that we live in. Like on the on the one hand, we're smack dab in the middle of the fifth, fifth mass extinction. Like there, there's no longer dancing around that. There's no longer maybe it's it's happening right. We're in the middle of it, and at the same time, we're living in a time in which it seems almost every day we're learning something new about other species and we're learning how similar we are despite all of our differences, mm -hmm. right? And especially work in cognitive ethology has shown that, that qualities that we used to think of as exclusively human are actually not only present, but pretty common in other animals, right? In 2012, uh, the Cambridge Declaration of Consciousness took place where uh, the, the world's leading scientists in the presence of Stephen Hawking signed an official declaration to, uh, to recognize that there is abundant evidence that many other animals from elephants to invertebrates like the octopus are not only aware of the world, but ha have very clearly subjective experiences, right? And birds, of course, are especially interesting in that regard because they're an example of convergent evolution, right? They have very different neurological structures from primates and great apes like us, um, but they also have, they display remarkable intelligence that's very similar to our own problem-solving abilities that would blow any four-year-old human child out of the water, right? 
tool use, the ability to recognize and remember human faces in, in COVID and um, Corvids is quite yeah. impressive. But there's also a dark side to that, right? Because we're learning that um, other animals, for instance, they can get traumatized. So, so parrots um, who have gone through uh, situations of abuse, they display symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, which are very, very similar to humans, right? And so we're in this moment where these two contexts come together and it, to me, it feels like a moment of particular responsibility. Right? It's not only that the climate crisis is a catastrophic ecological event, but there are other beings suffering because of it. And not only uh, other animals, but also other humans, because there are particular parts of the earth that are much more affected by climate change than others. And often those are um, the, the peoples who have contributed least to where we're at today. Right, um, So... You, you were just talking about this idea that uh, we we don't see ourselves as part of nature, right? And that's uh, in the West, especially, it's a kind of very old, very prominent cultural trope that, you know, as humans, we're um, exceptional. We're, we're not like any other animal and we have, we're um, hierarchically superior to them and we, we have the right to exploit them, right? And so in, in my, my academic field, in the environmental humanities, there's this belief that in addition to activism, in addition to uh, political change, we also need a cognitive shift, right? Mm -hmm. We need to somehow recognize that, no, we're part of everything. And if we destroy the environment and if there is biodiversity loss at the scale as it takes place today, it will affect people inevitably right we're part of this and so um I, I i wonder do you have any any hunch how to move towards that how how do how do we do that what are the kind of the small things that yeah. we can do to to push towards that big question i'm sorry <laughs> no no it's yeah i mean every sorry everything you're saying is really interesting as well i think this makes me think of um, actually a, a clip I recently posted of Instagram where I'm not saying anything particularly exciting apart from that I don't believe that humans are inherently evil and a plague on the planet. And nearly every single comment underneath is disagreeing with me. Um, and the common thread throughout all of them is that based or that all of them uh western and the culture that they see in the countries that they live in and the culture that they inherited is the only one that they can perceive and so living in kind of a very western capitalist country um their response to me saying humans are not inherently consumptive and stuff is yes we are that's the way that we're built that's the thing that we crave um versus obviously people all over the world who aren't able to even consume in the way that we do we do would probably not perceive that in the same way and so I think um I guess almost I, I feel like a lot of this is not to talk about colonialism, but I do think a lot of this is linked to kind of kind of the legacy of colonialism and the fact that there is still very much a Western attitude that we are kind of not just different, but the top of the pyramid and the best and the most sensible and the most logical and the most scientific and, you know, all of these things when in reality it's a web and there are different things that, you know, are more valid or less in various different cultures and views of the world and so I think a, a lot of this is kind of to do with unlearning kind of western white supremacy and kind of learning to see ourselves kind of within the world and it feels to me like climate change is kind of a very harsh reminder that we're not doing the right thing and we are going down the wrong path and obviously that reminder is not being heard or listened to um, but I, I think I, I genuinely think people understanding that we have the potential to be better than we are right now is something that we're severely lacking and probably need more of. Yeah. I mean, 
so, so much of what you're saying right now is I'm just nodding so hard, right? Because um, bringing up colonialism, that is important, right? Yeah. The, the issues in the United States um, that we have with wildfires right now, mm-hmm. and these are a legacy of colonial uh, shifts that have replaced indigenous land management practices with uh, Western approaches. And that's why in part, we have these catastrophic wildfires, right? I mean, all of these things are interconnected just like that. Um, you, you write about a, your experience in Rwanda in the book, right? And the after effects of the, the genocide there and when people were starving and that led to uh, hunting and, and poaching because people did not have another option and that devastated the local fauna. And it's it's like this this ripple effect, right? Or I I, I like the metaphor that um, there's an environmental philosopher Tom Van Doren, and he he writes about extinction as an unraveling, right? Mm-hmm. You can like kind of pull a thread like out of a knit sweater, and it starts everything starts coming apart, right? And I feel like this this awareness that we're really dependent on one another and that we're best as humans when when we are empathetic and when we do try to support each other because that's you know all animals are special we're we bring something to the table that other animals do not and focusing on that that can that can be really good right we we can do things that that uh, allow us to maintain a sense of hope without being just blatantly naive right but there, there's just just giving up seems wrong. Just the giving into the sense of apocalyptic doom, right? Yes, and it's also specifically being planted by fossil fuel companies because they know the carbon footprint thing isn't working anymore. Um, but genuinely, like I do think, kind of being hopeful and optimistic and pushing for change rather than just giving up, genuinely feels like a radical act when we are constantly being told that the world is ending and we should all just kind of roll over and take it you know um because very quickly but the kind of the way that we talk about environmental issues is always kind of a turning point and we have gone past many many points of no return animals going extinct the planet rising but it's not a cliff that we're going to fall off it's a gradual slope and even stopping at any of those points um you know we can't turn back but it's still better than it getting worse and it's still saving millions of animals and people from suffering and so I genuinely want to tell people like we can't like give in to the doomerism I guess like it's always important to carry on trying I think this is such a good point to move on to student questions um let's let's end on this note so we have a question from Aiden Ranzieri. And I, I'm not sure if they're going to be able to ask their own question. Or okay, so I'm going to read the question because the student is not available. Okay, so Aiden asks, your book, Bird Girl, is such an enchanting blend of your passion for birds and your vibrant life experiences. I'm curious to know if your writing process were a bird which bird would it be and why oh um I think a couple come I don't know why but the albatross was the first one that came to mind I think because I completely I wrote this book completely out of order and it kind of felt like I was kind of wandering through my own life kind of piecing it together a bit um but also um there are birds that you get in Southeast Asia and in Australia that kind of gather shiny, colorful things that they find on the jungle floor, bowerbirds to kind of collect together and kind of show off the beautiful things that they found quite often one color, like yellow or green. Um, and kind of gathering all of these birds together into one book, maybe, um, maybe felt like that. I, I love the, the original goal was I want to write about birds and there are hundreds of birds in this book. So I think I, I think I've managed to achieve that. Um, I, I love the albatross metaphor, especially in relation to Coleridge, you know, the old mariner and the albatross. 
So um, the next question is from one of my students, Abaco Contreras. And uh, he would like to know, as an experienced bird watcher, you are in tune with how birds have been impacted uh, by nature across time. What are some observations you've made that reflect that climate change is an impending global crisis? Yeah, I mean, it's lots of little things that kind of, it, this sounds really weird, but it's kind of not the big facts that you read in the headlines. It is kind of just the really small details I notice year after year. Um, so, for example, we have swallows that migrate from Africa to, in the winter to UK in the summer every year. And it's just one of the things that always gets me is noticing the birds kind of falling out of sync with the seasons. Um, you know, so birds arriving much later than they should, birds leaving months after they should. And just for me, that feels like a very visible indication of the way that things are kind of falling out of sync. Um and uh, yeah, and things like um, birds laying their eggs the time that they have every single year forever, um, but they're now being far too late in the year for when the food, ha like all the caterpillars hatch and things like that, so they don't have enough to feed their chicks. It's just lots of little moments like that that is really, I find really difficult. Um, and, you know, anyone can kind of go and talk to a grandparent maybe, and they'll have a story of when they were a kid, this bird used to be really common you, and you don't really see it anymore um, just because the just volume of nature that we have has decreased so massively. Um, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's it's so tangible, right? Um, one of my graduate students is here and would like to ask you a question themselves. Yashin, can you turn on your audio and ask the question? Yes, and apologies, I don't have video working. Um, it was wonderful listening to your discussion after getting to read your book. And my question sort of revisits your earlier discussion about the way that birding can foster eco-consciousness. Uh, you had discussed what bird watching can do for us in terms of mental health management, um, cultivating mindfulness and reconnecting with nature. And I want to lean more, especially into that idea of reconnecting with nature, especially because the term bird watching implies this gaze of the human subject being directed at birds as objects of our attention. Yet the title of your, bird, your book, Bird Girl, and really just sort of the substance of your personal story and listening to you throughout the discussion uh, today suggests a view of a much richer inner relationship that defies a human subject, bird object perspective. And so I was just wondering whether you could speak a bit more to how being present with bird life has informed your human life and then especially any insights that might suggest for how we can reapproach the ideas that we have about environmentalism. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think firstly, in terms of kind of asking bird watchers how birds have shaped their life, I'm probably not the best person to ask in that I was so young when I started bird watching, I genuinely don't know who I'd be um, if I hadn't, which sounds very extreme, but kind of my whole life has been shaped by it. Um, but there are so many moments that I kind of look back in my life and I can see the word, the ways that kind of birds and nature shaped me. You're absolutely right that it isn't kind of this impersonal, distant observation going on. It is much more than that. And I think, um, you know, e even the small moments of kind of being maybe a tween and, you know, struggling with the normal things you do when you're like 12 years old and the response being to go outside and be surrounded by nature I think I I don't know how to describe it apart from that feels very healing and very healthy and it does feel like this very reciprocal thing um and yeah I I don't know I th I think sorry I'm trying to think about this properly I think um the biggest thing I guess the reason 
I called it Bird Girl, but I decided to call this blog Bird Girl in the first place, which is how everyone knows me by Bird Girl these days, is because it kind of felt right. Like I was a girl, I was an 11 year old girl, but I was also someone who at the time felt much more comfortable surrounded by birds and nature than I did necessarily by people. And I think that there is something in that somehow. Um, I don't know, maybe proof that being outside is our natural state even if it's not something that naturally occurs within us um I guess like just to add a point onto that like um I'm mixed my family's Asian I spent a lot of my childhood being told that enjoying going outside was a really white hobby um and basically being told it wasn't something that I should enjoy and so kind of feeling almost more resonance with being outside and being surrounded by nature and birds than people kind of felt like very counter to everything I was told I should enjoy um but I still kind of that called to me I guess um sorry I don't know if I answered that but thank you um I think we have a little bit more time for a few more questions if you're if you're up for it um Another question from one of my graduate student, and that's from Ari Sandy Johnson. Um, he wanted to know, I've always associated birds with freedom because they have wings to fly away. This association was formed through stories that I have been exposed to since I was a child. Through some of your stories, I realized that freedom does not exist for the birds as they are suffocated by human dominance in wildlife. How do we help others see that a human sense of freedom does not need to come at the expense of the freedom of animals and wildlife? Yeah, I think, yeah, in, in the culturally, I think birds often are almost kind of a symbol of, yeah, being able to leave and go somewhere else. And I think when thinking about environmental issues birds actually aren't often what springs to mind for a lot of people because I think they are seen to have this ability of movement that even we as humans completely lack um and I guess to acknowledge the suffering of bird populations is almost to acknowledge that there is no inch of this planet left um I, I guess untouched by people um because you're right, there's a section in the book where I talk about um, how, how seabirds basically are, you know, they have the whole, all of the oceans to explore, to find food, and yet they are still struggling. Um, and so I think in some ways it almost feels like by, yeah, the, it almost feels like birds the final frontier, I suppose, in all of this. Um which maybe is why when it comes to climate change and environmental issues, it feels like there's almost an obsession with talking about trees and forests, maybe because they're very, obviously very stationary. And so it seems obvious that people can come and destroy them um, versus I think people like to imagine that when deforestation happens, the animals go to another forest and they can continue living their lives um which you know sounds really silly but I think there is an element of that because we are so numb to talking about things like deforestation um which I guess kind of ties back to what I was talking about earlier where communication um becomes really important in all of this because it's not helpful to kind of start campaigns talking about the interconnected web of biodiversity around the world and so it's like figuring out another way to communicate that again without people feeling like there's no point to any of this I suppose um but yeah but uh, sorry also just quickly like um I I have a chapter about the spoonbilled sandpiper in the book um which was the first big sort of bird campaign I did when I was a kid and one of the biggest issues in saving the spoonboard sandpiper was the fact that it lives in multiple countries. It breeds in the Arctic tundra, it migrates down the coast of China, and it winters in places like Bangladesh and Myanmar. And so kind of fig figuring out how to work with various different peoples and governments was one of the most difficult things in terms of trying to save these birds. And I think it kind of highlights 
I, I guess like the artificiality of borders but also just in general kind of the lines that, that humans draw are not ones that animals and nature necessarily adhere to um and we can't expect them to um but yeah we're, we're almost out of time but there's an audience question that sounds really fun and um it's uh student is asking, I'm continuously amazed when I look at birds and realize that they're essentially living descendants of dinosaurs. And they're wondering if you have pondered this in your book and what your thoughts on that are. Yes, um, I think I think about this all the time, actually, both in terms of the birds that do look like dinosaurs, but also, sorry, I'm looking at the cover of the US edition and it has hummingbirds on the front and I think I'm constantly amazed that something so small and delicate could have come from dinosaurs um but actually my favorite birds I, I just if you read it you realize I, I love kind of the big scary birds that could kill you and for years and years my favorite bird in the world was the southern cassowary which I think of all the birds in the world is the one that most looks like a dinosaur like, you know, literally six feet tall, kind of a bony crest on its head, um, this massive long neck and these massive kind of three-toed talons that kind of shred you to pieces with. I genuinely think that it is a living dinosaur and you should all totally go and Google it because it's a really cool looking bird. Thank you so much, Maya. And, you know, that was actually something that I did a lot while reading your book. I had my phone next to me and every time you would mention a bird, I would look it up. <laughs> and that's, I, I guess that's also a, a way of getting people to realize how many of them are out there and how amazing they all are, right? Thank you so much for focusing our attention on big and small birds and questions of conservation and connectivity and mental health and um yeah a brighter future i would i would like to thank you and i would also like to thank dean jeffrey cohen and english chair christian radcliffe for their support and kristen larue and bruce matsuga for their help organizing this event uh, additional thanks to Brian Echeverria from Macmillan Publishers. Finally, I would like to thank our incredible ASU writing teachers who work tirelessly to help ASU students imagine a brighter future. Thank you.